I've got about 50 slides, but I'm just going to fly through them just to give people a overview of what the brain tumor program here is doing and what we're uh, doing in, in, uh, in the Ivy Center, because some people have been here for a while and the fellows and don't really understand or know about the Ivy Center. So the Ivy Center was uh, a center started by Greg Foltz, my predecessor, who recruited me here as he was dying of pancreatic cancer in 2013. Um, it was funded by Catherine Ivey in the middle picture, whose husband died of a GBM in, 20, in 2001, and she's a philanthropist, and gave uh, millions of dollars to establish a uh, sort of a kid's glove, hands-on clinic for patients with brain tumors and translational research. She funds research throughout the country at world-class centers. Um, I was in LA at a meeting with people at Caltech and from TGen, which is a Phoenix-based research center, and she funds these really top-notch places like that in UCSF. Bottom line is GBM, if you look at panel A, that's the natural history with no treatment, you know, 50, 100 years ago. Radiation, uh, excuse me, extensive resection doubled or tripled survival, and that's a key point. Um, radiation plus, excuse me, resection plus radiation, again, uh, advanced about 50 percent the survival, and chemo has had a moderate effect until the advent of timozolomide, um, which uh, in 2005 was published in the New England Journal showing that there was a breakthrough, but, you know, it's not really a breakthrough. It me the median survival shifts, if you look at the 50 percent survival, from about 12 months to about 15 months. And that's due to the MGMT gene alone. The MGMT gene is, makes a protein that deactivates timidar, it pulls the molecule off the DNA. Uh, if that gene is methylated, in other words, if it's not able to be produced, then you actually have a better response because the chemo cannot be deactivated. That only occurs in about a third of GBM patients, and you can see that one third of people shift the whole curve. So if you are the two thirds that are MGMT unmethylated, there's really zero response to timozolomide. So two thirds of our GBM patients are, in my mind, getting treated uh, inappropriately. That's a controversial statement, but. It's fact. Um, one thing that's lost in the shuffle. <laughs> one thing that's lost in the shuffle is that uh, aggressive surgery um, ha can have as big of an impact or more than uh, chemo. And patients that have had uh, uh, complete resections of GBM and supra complete resections, as as they do at MD Anderson, you know, if you have a right frontal tumor, if you ex ex resect the tumor plus a centimeter or two around it, you can have a, a, as dramatic an effect as any uh, other therapy out there. And I, and that's what I, you know, it's, it's pushed the envelope for me for uh, trying to resect these tumors. In the last two years, we've had a new kind of curveball come in, which is um, the tumor treating fields. This is the Novacure device. Um, these little guys stick to your head and uh, essentially have 100 hertz alternating electric Currents which uh, paralyze microtubules. So when cells divide, the microtubules form tubulin and they have to dissolve to allow the cells to pull apart. If you stun those microtubules, they can't pull apart due to this dipole effect. And that's the concept. And uh, it's, it was shown in a prospective randomized trial that you know, some improvement in survival. So it's FDA approved for upfront and recurrent GBM. So despite all these improvements, we haven't really gotten a dramatic improvement, which is what we really need. And uh, we have, you know, continue to push the envelope with every mechanism possible, imaging, surgery, you know, there's only, only so much you can do with these things. But I think the, the breakthroughs are going to come from uh, the, personally, I think it's going to come from the immunotherapy uh, field um, and maybe uh, cancer stem cell concepts. You know, I'm just going to briefly mention that, you know, 2017 with imaging, we can sort of more un elegantly understand the tumors. We have cerebral blood, blood volume studies and uh, studies of um, diffusion and ADC that can help us define tumors preoperatively. You can stratify these and pretty much uh, high confidence that these will correlate with your um, pathology at the time of surgery. But that really doesn't do much more than give you more of a clear indication of what you're up against. You know, we can push the envelope by using more aggressive resections with uh, fMRI, 
and you know using intraoperative techniques, frameless stereotaxis, awake uh, surgery, all of these things are allowing us to push the envelope. And I'm just going to, you know, go straight to a paper by a German group that was uh, investigating 5-ALA, which is a fluorescent marker. Um, and uh, this is the closest we have to class 1 evidence that, that extent of resection for GBM improved survival. In this study, they were looking just uh, secondarily at survival, but they wanted to see could they get a better resection if they had the 5-ALA intraoperatively. They did get a better resection, and in a retrospective analysis, uh, they found that the progression-free survival was uh, uh, double for those who got a complete resection based on 5-ALA. So um, it is good data. It's level two evidence that degree extent of resection correlates with improved survival for GBM. When I started in neurosurgery at UAB, um, my chairman was a nihilist, and he said, "You know, this is a this is a diffuse disease." We should do nothing more than biopsy these old people with GBM. And I really actually have um, taken a, a turn in the way I approach it. Um, you know, we use all these other techniques to try to push the envelope, especially for uh, tumors that are in the near the motor cortex or the speech area. Um, this is just an example of a case that somehow got to me after this lady went to somewhere else and they said, look, it's a, it's a right motor cortex tumor. She's 70 years old. It's likely a GBM. There's nothing you can do. But I took her to the OR, and um, and uh, you can see this is the motor cortex. That's the sagittal sinus here. And we did, um, you know, basically intraoperative resection. And I don't know if this will play, but, um, you know, she was awake. We resected the tumor, asked her to move her hand, as you can see. And we are able to get um, a complete resection of that tumor. Um, you know, it, it's a malignant tumor. It's it's fatal. Nevertheless, um, you know, post-op she was she was doing great and had the oops could move her hand. I don't know if I can play that. Yeah. You know, so and she actually survived over two years, and I and I think that had she not had someone push the envelope, she would have had a definite shorter survival with this GBM. So just because someone's older and has a GPM, even if it's near eloquent cortex, I, I still think um, if for my family member, I would want them to go somewhere where they can utilize all the technologies and techniques to uh, push the envelope. But as I mentioned, I think the important changes in this disease are going to come from studies of the genomics. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the things we've done uh, since I've been here. Um, we have a paper that's coming out in the journal Science probably in the next few, the next month or two, um, that started a long time ago with taking tumor tissues, big on block resection, sectioning them, um, following the patient's clinical data, taking uh, alternate sections, doing H and E stains, and then sending another section to the Allen Brain Institute, where um, where a computer algorithm showed. Diff different areas of the tumor, like pseudopalsating areas near necrosis or hypervascular areas. Someone did laser capture off of the microscopic slide, took that, did RNA-seq, sequence to RNA. And we've come to uh, understand, based on that, that, um, that different areas within glioblastoma actually have uh, different gene expression. Um, and about 10 years ago, someone came up with the concept that if you took all GBMs, they would break down into classical, mesenchymal, neuronal, and um, neuronal, I think. Um, it turns out that each person's tumor has all of those different things within it, and it's just uh, determined based on the predominance of which interest sort of archetype, architectural uh, area predominates. Essentially, this kind of area here is mesenchymal, which means it's, it's a high inflammatory state uh, low oxygen tension. It's like a it's like a infection almost, um, and you have a lot of uh, uh, hypoxia and um, T cells get up to about here, but they can't get in here because T cells can't penetrate hypoxic areas, which is which is actually the basis for a new biotech company for immunotherapy to get more oxygen in the tumors. Um, uh, and it turns out that cancer stem cells like to be in this environment in the hypoxic state. Uh, 
it's kind of interesting. It kind of recapitulates the fetal state. Another, another project that we have that we published last year in uh, one of the cell journals, Cell Systems, it's a new journal for systems biology, um, was based on the concept that if we could develop blood biomarkers for GBM, we could maybe m more accurately manage the disease. So we have a grant that we're submitting on to follow up from this preliminary study. But uh, the concept w that we took with the Institute for Systems Biology was that uh, you could take all the um, genomics data that's available out there, like thousands of GBM cases that have been sequenced, look at all the genes that are overexpressed, take all of those and look only for genes that are expressed from the brain, and take all those and look for only genes that are expressed on the cell surface or secreted. And that would theoretically encode for proteins that could break off and get into the bloodstream from a tumor. Um, and so we did all this sort of uh, hypothetical computer stuff and then um, came up with a set of about 100 things that we, hy we hy hypothetically thought might be produced by GBM and detectable in the plasma of the blood. Um, long story short, uh, you can make probes uh, with mass spectrometry to look for specific proteins and then you take someone's blood plasma, you run it through mass spec and you put these positive controlled probes in and even though the levels are pretty low, you can detect differences from uh, groups of normal people. So we looked at 20 GBM patients and controls from California, from Seattle, from somewhere in Midwest, and we ran all their bloods, and we came up with a, a panel um, based on all these analysis of genes that were um, more, yeah, bottom line is we came up with uh, 30 of them that we found were specifically different from normal controls and patients. And of those four of them, we, we went back and retrospectively said, we're going to try to pick who's got a GBM versus control. And we had incredibly uh, high level of confidence, like 99% sensitivity and specificity of these four proteins. I uh, can't tell you because it's in a patent, so you know, top secret stuff. But anyway, uh, these would be potentially biomarkers for following the level of disease of a GBM patient, which could be helpful in terms of managing since a lot of the therapies cause uh, changes that look like recurrent tumor, and it's called pseudoprogression on the scan. Uh, and um, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the stuff that I brought here and am continuing to, to um, pursue that's controversial. Like uh, 15 years ago, I found CMV. Uh, virus was in GBMs, and then people confirmed it and then confirmed it, and then there was like a thing in Science Magazine about it and saying it's controversial. Um, bottom line is most of you know CMV is a herpes virus, uh, and to EBV and HSV1, HSV2, and my um, lab group discovered back in early 2000s it was a very high level of CMV infection and GBM. And the reason we were looking for it, we were looking for some chronic infection that might like the brain, that might like fetal brain cells, like tumor cells. And as you re recall from, you know, pediatrics, the number one cause of congenital brain infection in humans is CMV. If a fetus in the second trimester gets infected, it can essentially eradicate the stem cells developing in the brain, cause calcifications. Uh, it's the number one cause of mental retardation and deafness in humans. Um, and the virus likes to live in the brain. So we uh, looked at some GBMs and did immunostaining. We saw that the brown staining is uh, viral proteins are in the tumors, not in the adjacent normal. Um, and uh, we looked for the RNA and DNA, found that throughout the tumors. And we came up with the hypothesis that a chronic viral infection uh, might persist in these tumors and might exacerbate the um, disease process. And specifically, if you look at the um, evolution of what we know about cancer and biology and brain tumors, we now think that uh, tumors arise from mutated cells that are called brain tumor stem cells. These cells may be one or less percent of the whole tumor population. Um, but from these tumor cells derive the, the rest of the bulk of the tumor. If you get radiation and chemo, you wipe these guys out, but these guys are resistant. Come back. <laughs> And for various reasons, we had the inkling that CMV might persist in these stem cells because 
studies in mice, this is a mouse brain. This mouse was infected with CMV, a murine strain with, that makes a balloon die when the virus is expressed. Uh, when you chop these brains up and put them in culture, the virus is reactivated in the persistent sites of infection. And all these blue zones are in the subventricular zone and specifically in, in the uh, cells that are um, nested positive, which are the glial precursor stem cells. So the virus likes the stem cell environment. And what we showed um, in a paper we published uh, a couple years ago in cancer research was if we grow GVMs from patients in culture in these stem cell clusters, that CMV uh, is expressed in the stem cells that are nested positive. And furthermore, if we take these tumors right out of patients and grow them in these stem cell conditions, um, if they were if we grow them long enough, the virus goes away. And if we reinfect them with CMV, they just go crazy. They grow like tenfold more rapidly and aggressively. And if we do that in the presence of a gene that knocks out the virus, they don't grow. Um, so we believe that the virus lives in cancer stem cells in GBM and keeps them alive. And we have genes that the virus is driving that we believe contribute to this. We're actually working with a colleague at um, UMass now, Tim Kowalik, who's a world's authority on viral genes. And we're sending tumor specimens. Um, these are di different patients. Um, and he's got uh, an analysis that can, uh, can sequence the gene expression from the tumors. And his specialty is looking at CMV isolates. And CMV is actually kind of like HIV. It's It's got a very vast diversity of gene, expre gene genomes. Um, and uh, bottom line is if you take CMV from all kinds of people and look at different components of their bodies, you'll find that uh, CMV that goes to the urine changes its genome in the body to a urine-specific uh, genome. If you take CMV that goes somewhere else, like the lungs, it's more, they, they all kind of go to this area. Um, Interestingly, this is from CSF from several patients, and all the brain tumors that we've sent are clustering in a small gene cluster uh, so far, and we have further studies we're going to do. So the concept is maybe the virus gets into brain tumors and mutates in a way that allows it to survive and maybe even promote the cancer. <clears throat> we're also taking tumors from patients and pulling out proteins using antibodies and then sending them for mass spectroscopy and we're learning which viral proteins are expressed in the cancer. Um, this is a famous slide that shows that tumors need all kind of uh, pathways to survive, especially immunological. And when we send these proteins to the uh, database and look at what cellular pathways these viral proteins interact with, they're very important in terms of driving metabolic and cancer driving pathways. So. We've got another grant we're writing to um, see how these viral proteins may be driving the tumor. So that's kind of gee whiz, neat stuff, but what's the impact on patients? So a colleague of mine at Carolyn's Institute has been treating patients with valgan cyclovir, and she found and published in the New England Journal in a small study that patients who take valcite, just an oral antiviral, um, they have dramatic improvement in overall survival with GBM with a median survival of around 40 months compared to the other GBM patients. The study was criticized because it was based on a retrospective analysis of a, of a prospective study that was negative, but the first study was, um, was actually not designed correctly. A follow-up paper is going to come out and confirm this. More importantly for my um, interest is um, my colleagues at Duke, John Sampson and Dwayne Mitchell, uh, got interested in our findings years ago, and they developed a vaccine against CMV for glioblastoma patients. So they take their dendritic cells and they put in a, one CMV gene, which you know may or may not be in the tumor. They've done two serial studies back to back where they vaccinate um, with the PP65 CMV protein. And bottom line is these patients, this is 13 patients, the median survival of these patients uh, was uh, overall, Peritia. overall survival was median survival was somewhere around um, around 40 months 
on this group and several are still alive years out. They did another repeat study um, similar to that that just got published last year. Only 11 patients, but um, now they're opening it to phase two. But, you know, controlled study, 11 patients, they got the CMV vaccine. The median survival was over 40 months. And they've got four of the 11 are still alive out past six years. So it's quite striking um, and promising. So um, I'm, we're, we're trying to work with some companies, biotech companies, people at OHSU to develop a better tumor-related vaccine for CMV. And finally, I'll just zip through a few things we're doing, uh, clinical trials for. I mentioned cancer stem cells are the cells that come back after tumor treatment. We're growing these from patients in the, op you know, we take their tumor out, we grow them in the lab, and then we grow up uh, millions of these uh, quintessential cancer stem cells, and we um, take them uh, and put them in little wells and run them through a robot and expose them to various drugs. And what we do is we put an internal control of normal stem cells and um, test them against all these various drugs. And occasionally we'll find uh, drugs that are extremely uh, potent against um, any given tumor. One such drug was, uh, was uh, disulfiram. As I mentioned, um, the bottom line is we're, we're, we now have this trial up in one. We've got 15 patients enrolled. We've treated three patients, or on the third patient now. So we basically run their tumor through and find FDA-approved drugs that their tumors are sens tumor stem cells are sensitive to and come up with a cocktail therapy. Um, so it's the first trial in the world to treat people with a, a high-throughput screen against their own cancer stem cells, and it's pretty exciting. So far, the patients are doing all right. Um, and the last things I'll just kind of fly through, but you know, despite our knowledge over the last 20 years of all the signaling pathways involved in cancer, you know, we've treated basically everything you can think of, VEGF inhibitors, Avastin, everything to block pathways. We still haven't come up with a, a single therapy that's going to target um, something and shut down cancer. EGFR, especially the mutated V3 protein, which was on a subset of GVMs, was thought to be a possible treatment option, and a vaccine to this just showed that if you shut off that gene, then the rest of the tumor will go on and survive without it and keep coming back, and that was a negative trial. A lot of efforts, as I mentioned, are focused on these glioma cancer stem cells, and various drugs that block pathways involved in these have been tried. Um, but um, I think the final analysis, is, and you know, 20 years from now, uh, what we're going to be dealing with are immunotherapy, immunotherapy approaches. There's been a massive interest in immunotherapy recently because uh, antibodies that um, block this thing and this thing have come out, and you can watch TV and you see ads for Keytruda and these things. Bottom line is cytotoxic lymphocytes, T cells, CD8 T cells. Um, in a lot of patients, they uh, express these proteins, CTLA4 and PD1, which keep them from functioning at the high level. So, if you can give a blocking antibody that knocks this guy out and this guy out, it will essentially turn up the immune system T cell response. Now, in a normal person, that might lead to autoimmune diseases. So, you don't want that all the time. In cancer, these tumor cells, um, in some cases, will express random mutated proteins, and your immune system has not been tolerized to those, and so it will see them as foreign, and then it will attack them. But if you take all the cancers we know of, melanoma is the highest mutated tumor. Melanoma, therefore, has the best response to these checkpoint inhibitors because if you just non-discriminately turn up the T cell response in a melanoma patient, the immune system will all of a sudden say, wow, these tumor cells have all these weird mutations. Let's get rid of them. Unfortunately, GBM doesn't have as many uh, proteins mutated on its cell surface. But um, nevertheless, you know, the, the concept of finding a viral infection or something like that that shouldn't be expressed in these tumors 
can lead to new avenues for treatment. So people are basically doing studies, and we've had a clinical trial we're funded to do, uh, where we're taking the blood from patients, isolating the dendritic cells, which are the sort of the quarterback for the immune system, um, and taking those dendritic cells, and then we're going to be putting the um, not the not the proteins, but the genes from the patient's own tumor stem cells. Uh, pulsing them into their dendritic cells, giving them back to the patient, and hoping that those dendritic cells will then express the proteins from the cancer stem cells of that, of that patient and, and tell the tumor, tell the immune system to attack uh, with T cells that tumor. But other approaches, um, we're finishing up a trial with a company called um, Northwestern Bio, Northwest Biotherapeutics, where we been involved for several years taking tumors out, um, and it's called the DC Vax trial. We take the proteins from the tumors and put them in the patient's dendritic cells and vaccinate them. Um, the results of that trial will probably be coming out in the next six months, and uh, it seems promising. Other people at Duke and other places are using viruses to put genes into dendritic cells or peptides to expose to these cells to make them expose them to the rest of the immune system. But the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, I think, in cancer therapy in general, will be understanding ways to um, define targets and allow the immune system to do the heavy lifting. Um, these are all the trials currently for GBM. We've been, we've been involved in some of these. Um, we're involved in these checkpoint inhibitor trials, the ones I mentioned briefly, where we're you know, trying to knock out the PD-1 and CTLA-4 genes. Um, and then there are all uh, these other kind of immunotherapy-related trials where you use immune targets, antibodies, and we're involved in this trial uh, targeting EGFR with a toxic antibody. Um, and then the last one I was going to mention we're involved with is TOCA 511, which uses a live retrovirus that um, selectively infects GBM cells and encodes for a yeast gene called adenosine deaminase, that gene is something that converts 5-FC to 5-FU, which is a, a fungal drug that can be converted to a toxic metabolite from that yeast gene. So it's actually showing promise, and the thought is that if you can infect the tumor cells and have them have a viral infection plus a toxic drug, you're killing tumor cells in the context of a viral infection, which is releasing dead tumor stuff plus virus cytokines to the immune system and causes a massive immune response. And it's promising. Um, so I think I'll just end there showing you guys that, uh, that um, we have a lot of sort of uh, preclinical, translational, and clinical trial work going on, um, and that the future of cancer therapy, you know, for GBM, you know, is going to have to go beyond extent of resection, radiation, chemo. Um, but the new era is uh, upon us, and um, things are happening fast, and it's exciting. I just was in a meeting in L.A. with the Parker Institute, started by Sean Parker, the guy who did Napster and then Facebook. He gave $250 million to develop an institute for cancer immunotherapy, and they invited me and some other people to have a little, um, you know, a, a session to just think about the future of immunotherapy for glioblastoma. Um, and so it's an exciting time. I think that's going to be the, the ticket for this disease because if the immune system can take on these tumors, at least in some of these animal studies, even a subsequent uh, challenge with a uh, tumor will be rejected by the immune system, so it's pretty exciting. Anyway, any questions? Hey, Ryder. you writer. give all of your patients uh, valve and cyclovir and antibuse? I don't. You know, the antibuse thing is interesting because one, for our clinical trial, we switched from growing the cells at room air to 1% oxygen, which because we discovered the stem cells live in 1% oxygen environment. And then the antibuse became less of a uh, top hit. Um, the valcite thing is controversial. You know, um, I was treating a lot of people in California with valcite because, but I could, but people would say, show me you know, the data where your clinical trial data that have proven it, a lot of oncologists don't want their patients doing this, especially if they're on another clinical trial. The problem is since 20, since 2004, I've written like five grants 
to do a clinical trial for Valcite. Could never get uh, Roche, who made the drug, to give us the drug because they didn't want it. It's, it was becoming generic. They didn't want it to be a um, competitor to, to Avastin. And then it became generic, and um, we couldn't, you know, try to work with people at MD Anderson to do a trial, and no one would pay for the clinical trial. So we have never been able to actually do the trial to prove. A colleague in uh, Sweden has gotten $3 million recently to, to do the trial, though, using, like, cheap generic drug from some company in India. It's kind of sad because once something is... Yeah, there's nothing wrong with Indian drugs. The problem is, uh, as, if you get into this business, you know, there was a paper in the, New, in the New York Times that showed aspirin actually has the best efficacy for breast cancer of anything. But there will never be a clinical trial looking at aspirin in breast cancer because no far, nobody wants to fund something that's not going to make people rich. And, uh, you know, a generic drug is, you know, people just start walking away when you talk about there's something that might work that's generic. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Thank you. Thank you.